Vecna has been with us since almost the very beginning of the game. 1974, Gary releases the three little brown booklets in one box for 10 bucks, which meant it was the most expensive gaming hobby product around at the time. But it's only a year or two later that we get Eldritch Wizardry. Eldritch Wizardry is where we get the first appearance of the Druid class, and it's where we get Psionics, which is kind of important. We may talk about that later on. And where we get some of the original lore of the kind of meta universe that D&D takes place in. We get Orcus, we get the Demogorgon, and we start getting some famous magic items like the Rod of Seven Parts, which I've used in my game uh, to great effect, and the Axe of the Dwarvish Lords. Ditto. Eldritch Wizardry is also where we get the first appearance, a reference to Vecna in the Hand and Eye of Vecna. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video. We're going to talk about Vecna, his history, how I would use him as a bad guy in a epic level, let's say 19th to 20th level game, and also just how I, my philosophy of running the, the big bad evil guy, the villain of any given campaign in combat in general. And if this sounds familiar to you, it's because you're one of the thousand or so people that watched us live stream this last Saturday. And I felt it was a pretty good video, but I felt like the signal to noise ratio in that video was poor. In other words, there was a lot of video, but the amount of actual lesson to take away from it, somewhat minimal. So I figured I would condense it all down into this video for you lovely people. I guess I should start by saying that there is use of language in this video one instance toward the end. The hand of Vecna, the eye of Vecna, and the name Vecna itself all come from a very specific uh, fantasy subgenre that Dungeons and Dragons, owe, or especially early Dungeons and Dragons, owes a lot to. And that is the kind of pulp uh, fantasy that of like, you know, Conan and Fawford the Grey Mouser. I, because specifically, Vecna is an anagram for Vance, Jack Vance, a one of the great authors of the latter half of the 20th century, wrote a hugely influential, he wrote a lot, but he wrote a hugely influential series on a lot of early gamers, a lot of early role-playing authors called the Dying Earth series. The Dying Earth series is hugely influential, and it's set in the far, far, far future of the Earth. It's technically post-apocalyptic, except it's so far in the future that the people living at that time don't think of themselves as living in a post-apocalyptic world. They have forgotten the use of science, and any such scientific artifacts are now viewed as Magic. And it's the, it's the, the post apocalypse of a much, much more advanced civilization, like our civilization, thousands of years in the future, where we have technology basically indistinguishable from magic. And then there's a collapse. And now it's thousands of years after that. It's the, basically the end of the world. It's taking place toward the heat death of the universe. And this tradition, I think you get this in Numenera. It's also basically Dark Sun, the idea that, you know, the sun is going out. We're, we're, we're dealing that the enemy that we're dealing with is more entropy than anything else. And also that notion that the science is indistinguishable from magic. We get, uh, you know, Thundar the Barbarian and Gamma World, which both of which I have a lot of affection for. But we also get adventures like Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, which is a big part of Dungeons and Dragons and module we should definitely talk about, but I am not going to spoil in this video. Another setting that is sort of wrapped up in this whole far distant future after a collapse. Now we're dealing with the heat death of the universe and alien technology indistinguishable from magic is Empire of the Petal Throne, which we're not going to talk about anymore in this video, but which I'm I'm actually a, a, I'm a moderate fan of. So my friend Jim Murphy is one of his favorite settings. And it actually this setting predates Dungeons and Dragons. It predates role playing games. It's something the author was working on. When D&D was invented and he was like, thank God, now there is a game to go along with this setting. It was a natural fit. We may talk about Empire of the Petal Throne in another video, but I just wanted to take a little bit of a detour and talk about Jack Vance and his influence on the game. If you haven't read the Dying Earth series, I recommend it just like uh, Three Hearts and Three Lions, which a lot of people who watched one of my early videos read and they all seem to like it a lot. So that makes me happy. I think it's fun to go dig around and do archaeology in the bones of this game that we all love. And he's also responsible for the way magic worked in Dungeons and Dragons for almost 40 years. Vancean magic is the way you describe how wizards memorize and cast spells in the early editions of the game. And it was considered extremely weird. It was one of the things that people would always throw out. As soon as they started house ruling anything in Dungeons and Dragons, one of the first things to go was the Vancean magic system. It was called that because in Vance's books... And you get a reference to this in the Terry Pratchett novels where Rincewind reads a spell from this ancient grimoire and the spell lodges itself in his head and has a life of its own. Well, in Vance's world, in the, in the world of the dying earth, spells and magic, once you cast them, 
they leave your head, right? So imagine knowing, for instance, Avogadro's number and you use it in a chemical formula and you forget it. It leaves your head. It's like a living being. And for a little while it dwelled in your skull. But then when you spoke its name, it left. And so that was how magic worked in the early days of D&D. You memorized spells. And then once you cast them, you forgot them and had to memorize them again. And for the people growing up, especially in the 1980s and later who hadn't read Jack Vance and didn't know about this tradition, this seemed incredibly weird. I, however, have always considered it to be one of the fundamental. I don't think we have it anymore more in D&D, but I think the Vancean magic system is one of the things that made magic in Dungeons and Dragons feel weird and like magic should and not formulaic. It felt bizarre. So from Vance, Jack Vance, we get the Fantastic Dying Earth series. We also get Vecna as a name, as an anagram. We also get, I think, Iun Stones come from the Dying Earth series, and we get Vancean magic, which I have a lot of affection for. But the hand and eye of Vecna come from a completely different but somewhat related source, and that is Michael Moorcock titanic epic influential it must be a publishing issue i think the eternal champion series should be as well known as the lord of the rings or as game of thrones we're talking about elric and Hawkmoon and corum and i think it should be a rite of passage for young nerds growing up when you're in class in seventh or eighth or ninth grade and you're talking to somebody who's reading these elric books that you've never heard of but you're reading these Hawkmoon books and you're each describing what's going on in them and you get to a point where you realize you're both talking about the same events happening in two different series with two different characters, but they intersect and then they meet and then they they bounce off each other again. Nothing nothing reads like Michael Moorcock's Eternal Champion series. It is fire writ upon the page. And one of the Eternal Champions is Corum. And Corum appears in a series of books. He's the last of the Vagda. There are like basically elves. And man is rising in the world. You've heard me talk about how in my campaign, Law versus Chaos is the major central conflict, which we get all the way going all the way back to Three Hearts and Three Lions. But it also is incredibly important in the Michael Moorcox book. Uh, in Michael Moorcox books, Corum, rep- the elf, the last elf represents law and civilization, and man, the Mabden rising in the world, represents chaos. And at one point in the books, Corum gets his eye skewered by the leader of the evil humans, and he gets his hand cut off, and he goes thusly without a hand and without an eye for a little while, until something happens, I don't remember exactly what, but he there's this giant, this massive giant that trawls the ocean, he's looking for something, and Corum gets caught in this net and finds this eye, and it's a, it's a giant it's huge and it's got facets on it like an insect eye and a six fingered hand so in my campaign the hand of vecna is always a six fingered hand and the eye of vecna is always an insect an insect faceted like a fly's eye I like linking my campaign back to the history and, in this case, the prehistory of Dungeons and Dragons. So my hand and eye of Vecna is always a multifaceted eye and a six-fingered hand. Originally, in the Moorcock books, they were called the hand of Rin and the eye of Kul. I believe that's how it's pronounced because it's basically Welsh. And I steal more than that. In the original book, and this is one of the things I think is fascinating about Dungeons & Dragons, we still have this tradition, this is still true in the Dungeon Master's Guide, in the original uh, Eldritch Wizardry book, the Hand and Eye of Vecna have no set powers. When you read about them, doesn't tell you what they do. Instead, there's several different, like, blank spaces, and it tells you how many times to roll on which chart of different artifact powers. The idea being, your Hand of Vecna and your Eye of Vecna are and should be unique to your campaign. When you're done rolling on this chart, the hand and eye have a couple of major powers and a couple of minor powers, and now you know what they do, and no one else's campaign is going to have exactly the same powers as yours. And the thing I like about that is this kind of pre-Greyhawk notion that all of our Dungeons & Dragons campaigns all take place in the same world, the same kind of multiverse, the same multiverse, and that you could travel from my world to your world, and they would be very similar in some ways. We would probably still find humans and elves and dwarves and barbarians and wizards and clerics, but it would be different in other ways. And so the Hand and Eye of Vecna, like all these artifacts, persist across the multiverse, and that is another very kind of pulp fantasy idea, very Moorcockian idea. In the Moorcock books, the eye of Vecna, when he puts this eye on and grafts itself to his face, he can use it to see into this other world, this limbo. And the first time he uses it, there's a pair of sort of undead barbarians standing there in this in this ghostly wasteland, just 
staring at him. And later on, when he's in trouble and he needs to save himself, he uses the hand. He doesn't know exactly what it does, but he has some sense of it. He uses the hand to reach into that netherworld, into that limbo, and summon these two undead barbarians who then fight, and they kill the things that are threatening Corum, and that puts them to rest. They were cursed to live in this other dimension, the only beings, as far as we know, in that other dimension. And it seems as though, well, that's a problem solved. This eye is super useful. The eye and the hand summon these things to kill whoever's uh, threatening Corum. The next time he is threatened by an even larger force, and this is the story of, you know, the Corum books, it's ever escalating, classic pulp storytelling. The next time he's faced with an even stronger foe, he uses the eye and looks into this other world. And the creatures that the two undead barbarians killed the first time he used the eye are now what he sees in that other world, which means every time he uses the eye, every time he uses the hand to summon these things, they have to kill something. They have to kill something, and if Corum doesn't give them a satisfying enough enemy, they will turn on him. So every time he uses the stakes are always increasing, the danger is always increasing, and you have no idea how it's going to end, right? Because sooner or later, he's going to get himself into some kind of fix, and he's going to summon these things at whatever's in there at that point, and they won't be enough. The villains he's fighting that are threatening him will not be enough to satiate the enemies that he's pulled from this other dimension. So when I use the hand and eye of Vecna in my campaign, I give them those powers. I remember my friend TJ drew from the deck of many things, and he drew the enmity of a devil. And I had no idea what that was going to mean. But later on, many, many weeks later, they were fighting a mind flayer, one of a pair. One of them had the eye. This one had the hand. And the one with the hand reached into this nether dimension and drew and summoned from it this bone devil. And it was the bone devil that had laid away to TJ's Dwarven Cleric's clan. And so this was the devil whose enmity he had earned. And that notion that the hand reaches into another realm and summons a creature therein is something I made up. Uh, it's just part of the tradition in my in my personal history, part of the tradition of the hand and eye of Vecna. I don't think we ever got stats for Vecna. If we did, they'd probably be in a module we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, when we first learn about him, he's just a lich. He's a very powerful lich, an arch lich, I think they describe him as. And we also know that he had a lieutenant, Kos, the bloody handed, and we have the sword of Kos, which is the sword that cut his eye out and chopped off his hand. And so there are these two legendary characters. One betrayed the other, and we can imagine them fighting throughout time. They avoid giving stats for things like gods after they released this book, uh, Deities and Demigods. This book was very popular, initially popular because it contained stats for gods from copyrighted materials that they did not own the rights to. And this was kind of in the early heyday of D&D when they didn't think anybody was paying attention. And it turned out people were paying attention because D&D was exploding in popularity. And so they released another Deities and Demigods that had the stuff like the Elric mythos taken out and the Cthulhu mythos taken out. But one of the upshots of releasing this book, and the thing that kind of cursed them for years at conventions, is that when you give gods stats, players will want to kill them. And Gary and the other employees at TSR would be inundated with players talking about how their character had killed all the gods and you know, had Thor's hammer and had all these classic artifacts and was based there was base they were basically unbeatable, from which you get the adventure Tomb of Horrors, which I uh, do not recommend. And so I think that taught them a lesson. Don't give out stats for gods. As a rule, players should not be fighting gods. But of course, you in your game, I think, you know, being threatened by Orcus or Tiamat or Vecna is a classic campaign ending struggle. Typically, what they tend to do in modules is you're not fighting Tiamat, you're fighting an aspect of Tiamat because they don't want the players to once again be able to kill gods. But I think between you and me, we can agree that a judicious use of god slaying, I think, can be a part of a uh, healthy diet. We get D&D &D in 1974, we get Vecna in 1976, and from then on, Vecna, the Hand, and I of Vecna are always a part of the game and its history. We don't get anything else on Vecna until uh, over the late 80s, where we get an adventure called Vecna Lives, which is a terrible adventure I do not recommend. I mean, if you want to check it out, by all means, I think you can probably get it for five bucks as a nice indexed searchable PDF on the DMs Guild. I think the work Wizards of the Coast does to put all these old modules up there is phenomenal, and they should get a lot of credit for it. But this is an adventure that begins, it's, uh, one of the things that Vecna is famous for in the lore of Dungeons and Dragons is he kills the Circle of Eight. And if you don't, if you're, if you're playing D&D, you know who the Circle of Eight are, even if you've never heard that term before. The Circle of Eight are explicitly in your campaign somewhere, or at least in the history of it, because the Circle of Eight are these eight wizards 
after whom many of the spells in Dungeons and Dragons are named. Odluke's Freezing Sphere, Bigby's, uh, you know, uh, you know, Manipulative Digits, Tensor's Floating Disc. And the interesting thing about that, which I literally just thought of while we we're making this video, is that this means that these spells were all discovered in living memory. All the spells named after these famous eight wizards, Morden Kanan's Magnificent Mansion, are all because they were, you know, the, the circle of eight. Those wizards were alive when people were playing. They were alive in characters in Greyhawk in the 80s. So I never thought of that, the idea that those spells are obviously the new spells, right? Invisibility, Fireball, these are spells that have been around for obviously hundreds, if not thousands of years. No one remembers who discovered them. But stuff like... Autoluke's freezing sphere must be new because Autoluke is still alive. So Vecna kills the circle of eight. He does it in the adventure. Vecna lives and you, the first thing that happens is the, in that adventure is the dungeon master hands out character sheets for Morden Kanan and Autoluke and Big B and Tensor and all those folks. And you get to play them. You get to play the circle of eight, but it's awful. It's a, that's a, it's a, it's a great idea. Terribly executed because essentially the dungeon master railroads all your characters into dying purely by DM fiat. Fiat meaning just waving your hand and deciding. And it explicitly tells you in the adventure, just start killing the characters at this point. Point to somebody and say, your character dies. No attack rolls are made. No damage rolls are made. This is terrible design. I think the idea of letting the players run these high level characters is a lot of fun. However, you would have to let them run them. You would have to let them play these characters qua the characters and then kill them and that would be really hard to do because these are like 18th level magic users and stuff like that so it would be incredibly difficult to design as an encounter but if you could do it i think it'd be a lot of fun they do not do it in vecna lives so i cannot recommend that adventure but the sequel to vecna lives die vecna die uh actually has got a lot of really good reviews and is considered a famous adventure it's a campaign ending adventure it's the last adventure i think published for a second edition DD, and is meant to explain how the world changed between second edition and third edition such that now characters function differently which i actually think is a kind of a neat idea so it's gotten really good reviews if you want to check it out there may be stats for vecna in this you may kill vecna in this i'm not sure that's the history of the character i think vecna vecna tiamat uh, Jubilex, who I pronounce incorrectly, it's pronounced Dweeblex, but I like Jubilex better and I'm a big fan of pronounce it the way you think is cool. I still think Sauron is a better pronunciation than Sauron. Ugh. So I like the idea of using Vecna as a bad guy. I was kind of upset and I told my friend uh, Liam this. I was kind of upset that Matt, Matt Mercer, got to use uh, Vecna as the big bad evil guy in his campaign because I love the idea of introducing one of the things, one of the reasons I want to stream D&D in the new year for you folks from third level forward is because I love introducing not only new players, but you folks to all these cool ideas, the, the, the kind of the backstory of Dungeons and Dragons for the first time. And Matt got to use Vecna for the first time. And I was like, ah, and I think Liam's response was, well, you can have Tiamat, uh, which I thought was great. Uh, so, but I love Vecna as a bad guy. He, what's, what's, what's not to love? He's a, a wizard that became a lich. He killed a circle of wizards that was so important that all the spells in D and D are named after them. And now he has ascended and become a god. He's sort of the archetypal wizard, evil wizard lich. And so that's one of the reasons I like him as a bad guy. I just like Tiamat as kind of the archetypal evil dragon. And Orcus is the archetypal evil demon, right? Each one of these classes of of creature get their own famous named bad guy. We've talked about the history of Vecna and some of the history of early D&D. How would I use Vecna in an epic high-level battle? Well, first, let's talk about how I think of bad guys in general. I don't mean like mini bosses. I mean like uh, not the end of this chapter, not the boss you fight at the end of this chapter, the boss you fight at the end of this book. Using my own campaign as an example, the players had fought and defeated Explicitica Defilus, the big bad evil guy from Against the Cult of the Reptile God, and Lareth the Beautiful, the big bad evil guy from the Moat House in the Village of Hamlet, also the same content is in the Temple of Elemental Evil. And then they went on to fight. They are now fifth level and ready to take on Calarol the Vile, who I talk about all the time. He's from Keep on the Shadowfell, the first adventure for fourth edition D&D. And even though I think that adventure is really badly written in the sense that the town, like a great starting adventure, should include a town for the players to start in. And the Keep on the Shadowfell does, but it is a terribly described town. It is literally like a quest hub from World of Warcraft. And I think that left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. The only references to NPCs in it, to to my memory at least, were the ones that had quests for you. And that does not make it feel like a real place. But the adventure, the actual keep 
keep on the shadow fell i quite like and i've used many times and it has an epic battle at the end and i use it as kind of the archetype for all such battles i fundamentally believe that sufficiently notable which is not necessarily the same as powerful you could have a sufficiently notable bad guy at third level a sufficiently notable bad guy should be able to break the rules of the game. And this is something we've talked about before. We've talked about how there must, by definition, there must be some classes that bad guys have access to that heroes do not have access to because whence come all these undead? The good guy necromancer, if there is such a thing, the PC wizard who takes necromancy as their specialty cannot make mummies, for instance, can't make vampires, but somebody's out there doing it. So we can imagine that there are shamans and uh, evil necromancer spellcasters. Furthermore, I basically look at the spell system in Dungeons and Dragons as a balanced system, meaning high level spells are more powerful than low level spells. And you can kind of tell based on what level spell is, how much damage it's going to do. And there are, there are balanced rules for uh, spells that require melee touch attacks and how much damage they do compared to stuff that targets your charisma. For instance, this is all uh, designed for players to be able to pick and choose without fear that they've gone down a rabbit hole and picked a, a spell that is badly designed. It is a balanced system. And therefore I'm not super enthusiastic about using it for bad guys. Because I think, I think notable bad guys, epic bad guys, the big bad evil guy of book one or book two or book five, I think in critical role terms for their final, for their final battle should break the rule, should have access to other abilities that you made up maybe even on the spot and that aren't in the book anywhere. But before we get to what crazy abilities, I gave Calaril the vial, which will sort of set you up for what kind of crazy abilities I would give Vecna. One of the first things I did when I was designing this epic, uh, you know, book one ending battle of my campaign was I made sure that there were some notable lieutenants in the battle. Uh, you can also use minions. I'm a big fan of minions from fourth edition. We've talked about those in other videos. You can just go online and search how do minions in fourth edition work to find out all the rules for them. But minions are a great way to throw a whole bunch of bad guys at your players and make them feel like heroes by waiting through a sea of bad guys without tying up combat and slowing it down too much. But I also like the idea that there are named lieutenants. So for instance, in the battle with Calero the Vile, I made sure that in an earlier fight, the fight against Explicitic and Defilus, when it looked like the battle was going to go against them, Explicitic of Defilus's Lieutenant Zur, a character I made up, a Yuan Ti, a Yuan Ti like champion or whatever, turns into a snake and slithers through the cracks in the floor of this swamp layer. So he just he basically swims away. And I did that on purpose when the players were second or third level because I knew I wanted to use him in a future battle. And so when the players bust into the, the ritual room at the end of the bottom of the keep on the Shadowfell, among other things, they see Zor there and they remember him as the bad guy that escaped from Explicitic of the Phyllis's lair. I like saying Explicitic of the Phyllis because I took, I spent a long time learning how to pronounce it. I also, in this battle, I put the Master of Ravens because I, as many of you who've been watching my channel for a long time know that in a spur of the moment when I had a fight in against the cult of the reptile gods in there's a, there's a, there's a church in the city, in the town, and there's a couple of monks in there. There's like four monks and one of my players was playing a monk and I thought I don't want to have four just generic monk bad guys. So I just, at the spur of the moment, promoted one of them and I said, he is the master of locusts, something I made up and I picked locusts on purpose because I didn't want just to be any random animal. I wanted it to be animals that have sinister or demonic associations with them. Even though this is a purely neutral order, I still wanted that sense of of uh, power that man was not meant to meddle with. So we get the master of locusts. And I told Tom, who was playing Baltair the monk, if you can defeat this guy in single combat, then you gain his powers. And Tom didn't know exactly what that meant, but he wanted to try it. He became the master of locusts. And when he, in fact, when he was on the other side of the door that led into the ritual room for Calderol the Vile and the end of this adventure and the end of book one of the campaign, I told him that he sensed the presence of another master on the other side of the door. And when he busts into the room and they see all this, this huge elaborate battle arrayed before them, uh, Tom Baltair's character sees the master of ravens. He's got, you know, he's a uh, bare chested, but he has raven wing tattoos on his shoulders. And Tom just told the other players, guys, I, I gotta go for it. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta fight this guy. And they're like, no, 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 we had a plan. You have to do this, that, and the other thing. He goes, I know, I know, but. 
I have to try, which was perfect. It was exactly what I would have wanted if I could have, if I could have wished. It's exactly what I would have wanted Tom to say, but I, I set everything up and he didn't let me down. And so now Tom has to fight the Master of Ravens, one of Calaral the Vile's lieutenants. I also, in addition to lieutenants, preferably named recurring villains, although that's hard to set up, uh, but it can be done. Apart from named recurring villains, I also like to have something in this big bad evil guy combat that is a terrain, an active terrain feature. So I'm not just talking about like it's difficult terrain or height uh, altitude adjustments, which I think are fun and easy to deploy. You can do those on almost any battle. In Keep on the Shadowfell, this isn't something I made up, by the way. I just happen to think it's really cool and really well designed. There is a huge effect. This is a person. The gateway is this big, this giant black doorway into hell, basically, where, where Calor the Vile is trying to summon Orcus. And this, this black void that you see in this gateway, this circular gateway, probably actually, if I were thinking ahead, it would be shaped like an omega or something, right? Uh, and this black gateway is, it's like oil. It's like a liquid that is, that is pulsing. Well, it turns out once combat starts that the black gateway is uh, uh, it's alive and it has intelligence and it gets its own initiative and on its turn it picks an npc and tries to mind control them into walking into the gateway right so that by the way having a <laughs> this has happened to two of my players now at least one of whom i guarantee you was watching this video hi jordy uh i've had at least two players end up walking into the black void against their will and it's it's hugely dramatic and it sets up an adventure in hell if you want to do that and maybe if you go to www.adventurelookup you can find an adventure set in hell. That's something I had a hard time doing, but Adventure Lookup didn't exist back then. Uh, the problem with this scenario is that a player that has six squares of movement, if they're so if they're within 30 feet of this gateway, they fail their saving throw and they're gone, right? Their their player, their character just go walks into this the horrible black void and they're gone forever, sucked into, into hell. So I I rolled behind the scenes to make it seem as though it was random, but I deliberately picked a character who was more than one movement away. So that they couldn't move all the way into the gate. They could only get, you know, some percentage of the way there. And then having seen what just happened, that player on their next turn did not run away from the doorway. They were too focused on killing Calor the Vile, so they stayed there. And the next time the gateway acted, I did roll. In fact, I rolled in front of the players. And it randomly chose that same character again. And he failed his save again. So as a result, my friend Red's character just walked into the void. But that notion, which is very dramatic, by the way, but that notion, and he had done some epic stuff before, then he had basically killed Calor the Vile, stay tuned. So he got his moment in the sun, which was cool, and then his character disappears forever. But that notion doesn't have to be a horrible black void, doesn't have to be a big gateway. That notion that there is some terrain element here in this area that is active, that is doing something, also helps set, it could be like a, a crystal that's going to, that's going to take over the world, that's going to, that's, who knows what. But it's an opportunity for you as a dungeon master to set a time limit. Time limits help ratchet up the tension and the stakes. The players know if we don't interrupt the ritual, then dot, dot, dot. And this is where I think all good action writing comes from. Will the heroes dot, dot, dot. That's the question. If we don't stop the ritual, then this thing, not necessarily this person, this thing, this object, the black gateway, you know, the kyber crystal or whatever, will do something. We'll do something active and we have to stop it. So I like having lieutenants that are ideally named for the players to fight. And I like having some cool active terrain feature that acts as a ticking time bomb that will go off at the end of the combat if the players don't stop it. Then there is how I actually run the bad guy. And what I did with Calor the Vile was I gave him a special ability. First of all, the players, because you're going to find this is a, this has always been a problem. You're going to find that bad guys are hard to keep alive because the players, there's, you know, between four and in some cases like seven or eight of them. And regardless of how many bad guys are on the field, there's only one of you. So you are constantly outnumbered by all these other players thinking and scheming and you're just one person. But ultimately, the action economy works in such a way that having four, five, six, seven players all acting and the bad and the bad guy only acting once is going to hugely unbalance the battle in favor of the good guys, regardless of what else is true. You can have legendary reactions and legendary actions and those help. But what I tend to do is make sure that my bad guys have abilities that that just work, right? A lot of uh, villain abilities in the monster manual require you to first fail a save. Like imagine like being grappled and then being swallowed. Like the first thing that happens is the monster attacks you and grabs you. And then on its next turn, if you're grabbed, it can swallow you, right? That kind of like 
uh, out of the frying pan into the fire design where it takes a couple of turns for the bad guy to do their thing is classic fifth edition design. But when it comes to my evil guys, I don't got that time. They're probably not going to survive till next turn. So I tend to make it that their, their stuff just works if you fail your save. They don't have to wait another round after that. So for instance, one of the things I did was when a player went unconscious, Calor of the Vile is a scion of Orcus. Orcus is the, is the demon god of undeath. Uh, Calor of the Vile could point at your unconscious form and you had to make a saving throw. This takes an action. It's not something he does for free. And if you fail your saving throw, you are one, instantly killed rough it's rough but consider that if you took damage you would instantly fail a death save and if you took damage three times you you would be dead then so somebody like calor the vile could just have all his minions attack you in which case the same thing would happen anyway but in this case he points at you you fail a saving throw you are instantly killed and brought back as some undead which i didn't i didn't specify which undead in my mind until it happened and the first time someone went unconscious and i used this ability they made their saving throw thank goodness and then the rest of the party was like oh my God, what does he do? What does that ability do? We don't want to know. It's something awful. Nobody ever go unconscious, right? And so I like that fact of telegraphing do, 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 to the players. Hey, this is crazy. This thing is going to be, this is going to be some rule breaking shenanigans going on here. So they know they have some ability to thwart that. Uh, now, amazingly, by the next round of combat, that same character had gone unconscious again, had been come back to life thanks to the cleric and then gone back down thanks to a lieutenant of Calor of the Vile. And then he used the ability on her again. And this time she failed her saving throw. And that's how we got Lady Serial the Vampire Queen, who's one of the great villains of my campaign. I don't think we've seen the last of her. So that's a rule breaking ability I give. It's something I just made up on the spot. I tried to make sure the players had some idea. I think I made it um, a wisdom saving throw because Lady Serial was a cleric and had high wisdom. So I wanted her to have a good chance of saving against it, especially since this was the first time we had ever seen this ability used, and that helped telegraph it to the players. Also, and my players hated this, but they believed in it, when Red's archer character shot, did the killing blow on Calorol the Vile before he walked off into the Black Gate, it kill Calor the Vile. It took him to below zero hit points. And in that moment, I described his skull splitting open and bone and brain spraying onto the wall behind him as the arrow cleaves to the top of his head. But then you see as his body starts to slump, you see this purple energy, uh, you know, start to cascade across the top of his head. And you feel this intense, oppressive weight come down from above you. This evil black presence descends on where you feel the oxygen leave the air. It's hard to breathe. It's the presence of Orcus. And he just speaks and says, you know, I'm not done with you. He says, rise. And Calderol the Vile, now reanimated by Orcus, comes back and now he's undead Calderol the Vile. And the players are like, what? What? That is nonsense. They hated it, but they believed in it because it is exactly what they thought would happen to somebody who was a loyal servant of Orcus. So then they had to kill him all over again, and that was a lot of fun, and it was a very tense battle, and that's when Red's character walked off into the uh, evil sunset of hell. And that's how I tend to run the big epic bad guy. I make sure they have lots of, I have a couple of lieutenants that can really challenge the players. They have a goal, they have a ritual they're trying to enact, and there's some object in the room, like an altar or something like that, or a statue, or in this case, the black gate, or I like a crystal for some reason, where at the end of this ritual, at the end of a certain number of rounds, something horrible is going to happen. In this case, I was ready not to summon Orcus. I think I, Lady Serial made a wisdom uh, check, a religion check, and I told her, well, he can't summon Orcus. That's ridiculous. He's not that powerful, but he could summon someone like Lord Soth, the Death Knight, which would have been bad news, right? Like with a capital B and a capital N. So the players know what the stakes are. And there's some, we've taken this idea of the stakes, what is at risk, what is being threatened. And then we contextualize it in an object that can act. It has its own initiative. that has its own will, right? So I think that's super cool. And then we break the rules and we give our bad guys crazy abilities that just can't be found in the player's handbook because I think spells are not enough. And I actually don't like giving spells in general to bad guys. I think... I think if you're if you're working Wizards of the Coast and you're watching this video, plug your ears because I'm about to be somewhat critical. I think it's bad design. I, it's it's you as a dungeon master already have plenty of nonsense to do behind the screen. Taking a bad guy and saying, oh, we want to make him a nastier bad guy. So we'll just go boop and graft a whole other game system onto here. Spells. And now you as a dungeon master have to go, okay, 
Well, all right, which of these spells are the good ones? He's got first level spells. He's not probably not going to cast those, but he might. He might have to. He might cast these first level spells at higher levels because that's how that system works. And I have to go look that up and figure out which are the most optimum and which are the most pessimum spells to cast. And I think that's a. Uh, uh, I think that's just more work than the DM should be expected to have to do. Uh, that's why I like the uh, you know the fourth edition. We've talked about this before. You stealing abilities from fourth edition and that Calaral the Vile ability that save or die and come back as undead is very fourth edition esque. Okay, so you've slogged through this whole video and you've watched me ramble on about Jack Vance and Michael Moorcock. And we've talked about Vecna and the hand of Vecna and the eye of Vecna and how I would run bad guys. How would I run Vecna if I had a group of 19th to 20th level characters? First of all, I wouldn't. I'd probably use Tiamat or somebody because Matt already took Vecna. Ugh. But uh, but I love Vecna as a bad guy. And I would set up something relatively similar. I would try to make sure there were some lieutenants there and there was some cool object that he was trying to animate or destroy or something but i had a while i was watching matt's epic finale the the huge epic battle with vector which was incredibly dramatic and i liked a lot had a ton of fun tweeting about it as was happening i was constantly thinking how would i do this if it were my campaign and i hope it's clear that this is in no way a criticism of what matt was doing that's ridiculous any dungeon master watching a big epic battle like that any dungeon master should be at home thinking how would i do this and in fact i think that's the beginning of becoming a game designer a professional game designer is somebody who can play a game and go how would i improve this that crit that being critical, that critical eye is not cynicism or pessimism. I think those are I think cynicism is the death of wisdom. I think being critical is just a part and parcel of being a good game designer. I was surprised, for instance, that Matt's Vecna, who was a god, right? He was an ascendant ascended god and was aspiring to some other greater fate. Uh, really basically was just a high level magic user. I don't think he ever did anything that a 20 plus level magic user would do. If we imagine there were epic levels in fifth edition, they would probably have access to more than one. One of my favorite parts of that game was when Matt cast a meteor swarm for the second or third time, which there is no, like, I think the most you ever get is one ninth level spell. And so when he cast the spell, people were like, what, what? And Matt's like, he has more than one ninth level spell because he is a fucking god. I know, language, I apologize, but Matt said it first, so it must be okay, right? While I was sitting there watching this and just having a blast and a lot of fun, I was thinking about how I would do it myself. And I thought, Vecna is the god of secrets. He's the god of lies. I think he's also a god of evil and magic. So he should be doing things that reinforce this idea. He should be breaking the rules. But just as Calaral the Vile, Scion of Orcus, demon lord of undeath, broke the rules in the sense of making things dead and then making them undead, Vecna should be using breaking the rules in ways that inform uh, knowledge and magic. For instance, if you were paying attention to Critical Role, you saw that they had a certain uh, standard operating procedure with all, which all adventuring groups develop over time when they, they cast certain spells in preparation for a battle. And one of them, the one that kind of stood out to me as being sort of annoying if I were a dungeon master, is Hero's Feast. Well, I think Vecna while they're hunting him, while they're trying to find him, while they're on the, their way to his lair, should be enacting a ritual that finishes before the battle even starts. And that ritual, Vecna's ritual, this god, he is a godlike entity. He transcends space and time. He breaks the laws of nature. Vecna, if he finishes this ritual, could erase a spell from the history of the universe. It's gone and no one remembers it. I would have, I would take Ashley Pike's character sheet, and I would replace it with a copy that was just missing Hero's Feast. It just wasn't listed there. And when Ashley would say, okay, I cast Hero's Feast, I would say, "You cast? I'm sorry, you cast what? And she would say, Hero's Feast. And I would say, what's that? And it would be great if I could have a dummy player's handbook that doesn't have Hero's Feast in it. That would be amazing. And there's probably a way I could engineer a, I could engineer a prop like that. That would be part of the fun is selling these ideas. Not only you, your, your rule breaking ideas can't just be random stuff you came up with. It needs to in some way reinforce the theme of the villain. Something like the god of magic, the god of secrets and lies, just deleting a spell from the history of the universe. And especially a spell like Hero's Feast, which is, it gives the players a huge advantage, but taking it away from them doesn't cripple them i don't think uh i think would be a lot of fun and it would really it would really sell to the players that they are fighting a god not just a high level magic user this is a god and he's going to he's going to change the fabric of reality in unexpected ways that make the battle more of a fun challenge it's not just the normal battle they've done before but a guy with more hit points and more spells
What else could Vecna do? Well, I like the idea that he has an ability where if you fail a saving throw, this would be great. People ask me, how would I handle Scanlan? And I really have no idea because I don't I don't watch Critical Role in that way, right? That's sort of the Dungeon Master job, I think. But having come up with this idea, I think this is a good way to handle somebody like Scanlan, cast a spell on him, and make the saving throw something that Scanlan's not going to do. An intelligence saving throw is perfect. An intelligence saving throw is perfect for somebody who is the god of secrets and lies because that's that's knowledge. It's the opposite of knowledge. Knowledge is intelligence. Did you fail your... Sam Scanlon, I think, has like some crazy low intelligence. It's low intelligence or wisdom. I don't remember which. I would have him make a saving throw against that ability. And if he failed, I would take his character sheet from him and I would pick a level, a spell level, fifth, I think, or seventh. Not eighth or ninth, because those are important. But fifth or seventh, there's a lot of really powerful spells in those two levels. I pick one of those, let's say seventh level, and I would cross off all his seventh level spells. I would hand him his character sheet back and the player's handbook, and I would say, okay, look at the list of seventh level bard spells. Here's a 20-sided die. Start rolling. And you're going to repopulate your spell list with random spells. Now, it's possible that you will get some of the spells you had already memorized and have now forgotten or chosen, prepared, I think is the term they use. That's that fancy in magic. Every time you hear me say spells memorized, I'm remembering advanced Dungeons and Dragons spells prepared. Uh, now you have to prepare all new spells because what you thought you knew, you don't know. That's what Vecna does. What you thought you knew, you don't know. You're going to get probably some of those spells back just by random chance, but you're also going to get other tools. I didn't take your spells away. You still have spells. It's just not the ones you're used to relying on. And a huge part of the juice of Dungeons and Dragons for me is watching my players take these resources, usually magic items, but in this instance, the spells that they have memorized that they didn't, didn't plan on using and trying to come up with some crazy way to use these new spells that they hadn't planned on before. That is a hugely challenging thing to do to the players, but again, I don't think it really cripples them. It just replaces one set of problem-solving tools with another unexpected set, and to me, I think that would be a lot of fun. Something my friend Phil, Phil Robb, uh, owner of Turtle Rock Studios and my current Dungeon Master, having a lot of fun in his campaign, when we were talking about this, one of the things he suggested, I'm a huge fan of credit where it's due, and I didn't want to take credit for this because I thought it was a brilliant idea, was he said, yeah, you know, have uh, two players make a saving throw, and if they both fail, Take their character sheets from them and swap them and say, all right, uh, this would be, a, I, don't, I don't know why I just picked these two people in my head, uh, except it seemed amusing to me, but there's a more than one layer happening here. All right, Laura, you're now playing Grog. Uh, okay, Travis, you're now playing Vex. And I think that would be a blast, right? Mind swap. That is exactly the kind of thing that a god should be able to do, especially a god of secrets and lies, right? He's, again, what you think you know, who you are, you don't know. That, again, is a wildly game-changing thing to do, but, again, I haven't taken anything away. I haven't really crippled the characters. I've just swapped the tools that they get to use. I also like the idea of how a spell, a, a, an ability, it doesn't necessarily have to be a spell, an ability that affects everyone within range. They all have to make saving throws. The ones who fail, I would put a 3 by 5 card in front of them. This would only, really only work once to the first one who did it. I might, I might have different results on different cards, but one of those cards would certainly, the next time that player made an attack roll, and hit, I would say, flip over your card. And they flip over the card and it would read, you're playing low ball now, which means high rolls are bad, low rolls are good, and the math is flipped. And again, that's something that would mess with the player psychologically, that would mess with them. Really, what happened? They just missed one attack, they would have hit otherwise. And from this point forward, they're, they're just doing the math backwards, that's all. But it would still have a fun psychological impact on the battle. Another thing that I would toy around with, um, that I, I've never done, I've only read about. So, caveat, um, uh, vector, view, viewer? I don't know what the, uh, videographer? I don't know what the Latin for viewer is. Caveat, caveat, caveat visor? Caveat, caveat visor, I think. Let the, let the viewer beware. I would have, I would try using rules I read once long ago and now lost to the midst of time. I spent a long time trying to find these rules online. I couldn't do it. There was in the sage advice in some old issue of Dragon Magazine and hopefully some brave soul in the comments below can link to the, the sage advice I'm talking about. This would have been in the eighties, probably in the mid to late eighties when I was back when I started playing. 
I might try using the rules for super genius intelligence. How do you roleplay someone who has a 25 intelligence, for instance? Somebody like Vecna, whose mind transcends normal mortal limits of things like a 20 intelligence, right? If you imagine, for instance, that Einstein is a 20th, as, a, as an intelligence of 20, what would somebody many times smarter than that? How would they think? Well, these rules in Dragon Magazine imagine that you would have the players, um, all roll initiative as normal. And then they would all declare what they're going to do. They haven't acted yet. They're all just going to go around and they're going to declare what they're going to do. Then your super genius intelligence character gets to go first with that knowledge. They know this hyper intelligent creature knows they're such a master tactician. They know what you are going to do. And then on your turn, you have to do those things. This is actually somewhat related to the Greyhawk initiative idea, which I quite like and also haven't tried. That system also had rules in it for giving villains fatal flaws that could be exploited to thwart this. But again, I do not remember that system. I would probably have to make something up. But I like that idea that Vecna, perfect for this, a lich, a creature of iron will and intelligence, is someone so smart, he knows exactly what you're going to do. Maybe I would only have that work for one round right and maybe the first round of battle and that would that would really set the tone and the players would freak out thinking this was going to happen every round but no it only happens the first round you know the the chaos of the battle becomes impossible to predict but that first round vecna has scried you he's researched you he knows exactly what you're going to do so you're going to declare your actions and you're stuck with them you have to do them but vecna gets to go first all right what did we talk about we talked about the origins of vecna in the early history and in some cases prehistory of the game we talked about running bad guys in general and my advice for running big, bad, evil guys. And we also talked about how I would run Vecna that I don't think, I mean, the number of people watching this who are ever going to get the opportunity to throw Vecna at a 18th, 20th level party is probably on the uh, less than a dozen, right? But hopefully this serves as a useful guide toward making up your own evil bad guy abilities. And my rule of thumb, and of course I tweak these things left and right, is that stuff the players have no ability to um, thwart ahead of time shouldn't cripple them too much, but I have no problem swapping out the abilities that they rely on, because that is, I think, a fun and interesting challenge. Otherwise, I like making sure the players get to see these things, uh, you know, a little bit ahead of time or get them used on maybe an NPC or something like that so they know what they're getting into. Uh, but my rule is that big, bad, evil guys should break the rules. The rules are there for the players. The rules are balanced for the players. Spells and class abilities are balanced so that any player can take any one of them. And if they do them at the right level, that it won't break the game. But this isn't a war game. Uh, your encounter shouldn't be built like a war game. You should feel empowered to you know, what, three or four or five times, let's say four, four times over the course of a 20 level campaign, introduce bad guys who can break the rules. That's part of what makes D&D a fun challenge is the fact that the party has figured out how to be a party. They figured they've gone through lots of combats by the time they're fifth or 10th or 15th or 20th level. They feel like they're, they've got a routine down. Well, your bad guy is going to change that routine. And it's going to throw them a curveball. And that is when it gets interesting and memorable, I think. That's it, folks. That's the episode. I think this is a part of a series, the uh, How to Run Bad Guys series. This is episode three. I think so. I'm not sure. Special thanks to uh, Michael Hogan, who sent me codes. He's one of the guys that worked at, he works on one of the company, works at one of the companies that worked on Destiny. And I was really, and have been really looking forward to Destiny 2. And he sent me uh, a key, which is great, which means I get to play with my friend Lars, whom you folks know. So thanks, Mike. Also, special thanks to Tom Jordan for this 3D model. Those of you who have been following the the long and storied um, history of the forthcoming early January Kickstarter, you know one of the things I want to be able to do is make minis, dragons, special kinds of dragons that you can get as allies as part of the Stronghold rules. But we don't know how to make minis. That's something we are figuring out. I put some concept art up during the live stream that people saw and got a huge kick out of. And literally like 24 hours later, Tom had posted this 3D model of one of those pieces of concept art, which we are going to use just as a prototype to see, can we make uh, resin cast minis? We're not going to, this is not a finished thing. Uh, the uh, We're only going to use it for our own prototyping purposes to work out our, to see, can we do it ourselves? And if it turns out we can, then we finish getting concept art, we get final art, we make new models based on that. If you know anybody, I don't mean 
you are aware of. I mean, you literally know somebody who does resin casting professionally. Please let me know. Contact me, Matt at mcdmproductions.com. I put that same thing out there before regarding injection molding, but injection molding is stupid expensive and it's for companies like Reaper and we're never going to be that kind of company. Also, something that I wanted to pimp a little bit that happened that uh, seemed really important to me that went largely unnoticed and unremarked on in my videos is uh, months ago, I did a video on the West Marches style of play. How do you run D&D when you're sick of game night, when you're sick of players just showing up? I'll see if I'll put a card up here if I can figure out how to do it. I'll put a card up here or up here, up here. I'll put a card up here saying, linking to the West Marches video, which is a style of play for, I'm tired of my players just showing up on Thursday night because it's game night and they're not engaged. The West Marches, you know, lobs the ball back in their court and says, we're only going to get together when you guys have a goal and you guys have figured out who's going where. Then I will prep that content and I will run it for you. And after that video, which was hugely successful, I saw dozens, if not hundreds, of West Marches campaigns start up. I imagine most of them fizzled out because I imagine all, all campaigns end and fizzle out. That's no surprise. But based on that video, a whole bunch of people got online. They created a Discord. They created a subreddit, which I will link to. And they have been running a West Marches campaign with at least at one point, there were hundreds of people in it. There may still be. They, I, I, I haven't looked in in a while, but it was pretty amazing to me that for at least a little while and maybe still now, there were hundreds of people all playing Dungeons and Dragons in one big giant shared universe with many, many Dungeon Masters. If that sounds interesting to you and you're willing to Dungeon Master, because I assume that is the currency that everything trades in over there, uh, check out the West Marches uh, subreddit that I'll link to in the doobly-doo. As always, these videos are brought to you by my novels, Priest and Thief, which are uh, currently well-reviewed on Amazon. You can get them in print or you can get them digitally. Doesn't matter which you get. I've priced them all now, so I think I make about the same amount of money on all of them. So go crazy to your heart's content. I've revised them recently, and they are now shorter and punchier. The first one, mostly. That needed a lot of revision. Uh, and as a result, I'm really proud of them. If you want to help support the channel, buy those books. They pay for all this crazy equipment, like... The green screen I used, I don't know why, I just thought it would be fun to try again. We tried it before I got a new green screen that's easier to set up. I assume you noticed that there was something weird going on with the with the visual, uh, but I thought it might be fun and may, it would, might let me shoot videos at different places in my house or in a more convenient way and use different backdrops that might be fun. That stuff all gets paid for by the proceeds from the books that you folks buy. Also, I think you folks know that I am the author of the Critical, the official Critical Role comic. So if you've heard me talk about Critical Role and you have no idea what it is, I recommend you hide the hence to Comicsology. Uh, I don't get any like kickbacks from this. They, they just pay me like, 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 like you would expect. I just enjoy this process of writing them. I love these characters. I love writing these characters. I feel like I could do it forever. I, I'm almost certainly won't. I'm, they will probably want to switch writers and or artists at some point because that's how comics work, uh, which I'm totally okay with. But for now, the first six issues are a story that I pitched to Matt about how these characters met each other. Because when they started playing, the characters just, the players just decided we know each other. Don't worry about it. We want to play. And so I invented this idea of a story where they all meet. And I think it's issue three comes out next week. And I think it's going to get better, at least, especially, I don't know about the writing, but definitely the visuals. Olivia, who the artist, is just constantly knocking out of the park and surprising me all the time with the stuff that she's adding to the stuff that I'm, I'm describing. And we, but we did just get up until now, the books have been essentially laid out by me. I've been like art directing it and I'm, I'm terrible at it and shouldn't be doing it. But we got Chris Kawagiwa, whose name I'm pretty sure I pronounced right out of the gate without having to look it up, yay me, uh, to do the layouts. And his layouts are way, way better than mine because he's a pro. And I think they're going to get even better once you guys see uh, issues four, five, and six. Issue three comes out next week, like I said, and I think that's when finally all six players will have met. Although if you know me and you know how much I love the getting the team together story, you will not be surprised if their meeting is less than felicitous. No spoilers. So that's it. Those are all the announcements. That was the how to run big, bad, evil guys. I, I don't know what video is going to be next. I may do a video on initiative when because the, 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 the tuning of when to call for initiative is a very powerful tool in the Dungeon Masters, both storytelling toolbox and tactical gaming toolbox. Or we might do a video on how to award experience points, because for some reason I get tons of people asking me, how do you award experience points? And I didn't know 
I didn't know there was an issue. So I'd be happy to make a video on that. We may do Appendix N. We're not done with the politics series. I think we're going to do, if I can get my hands on a copy of Xanathar's Guide to Everything this Saturday, if I can get my hands on that book, I believe it'll be in game stores by then, then we will do a live stream Saturday night, say seven o'clock, in which case I'll just read through the book and talk about like we did with the Volo's Guide, which was very successful, a lot of fun to do, a lot of fun for me talking about what I found in there, because a lot of these things are from earlier editions of the game. And you know how much I love the history of the game. So it was fun to talk about. If I can't find a copy of it, then I we're, we're screwed. We won't we won't get together on uh, Saturday night. We did a live stream last Friday night and getting from my office to here in time was hard and I didn't like it. So we won't be doing that again. Uh, but but maybe future Saturday live streams are in the cards. That's it, folks. Hope you liked the video. Until next time. Peace out.